Welcome, McFarland. Welcome, guests. Welcome, everyone. It is so wonderful to connect with you, to see you. Well, we can't exactly see you, but we know you're there. We know God is with us, and we're connected in worship today as we sing together and pray together and listen for the voice of the Spirit through the words of Scripture together. Welcome. Welcome, guests. If you're a guest, we'd, we'd really like to know that you're worshiping with us. And everyone, you can uh, click on the link in the chat box or go to our website, mcfarlandumc.org slash connection. And there you can let us know that you're worshiping with us. Also, submit your prayer requests and joys and celebrations. Let us know how we can pray for you and with you. You can do that on the front page of the website at the red prayer request uh, button where you can tap or click. We appreciate all of that very much. And so now our senior associate pastor, Wendy Neal, is going to share some about our life and ministry together as we move into worship. It is so wonderful to worship with you today and to proclaim that this is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're so happy to let you know that in addition to our online services, that we are offering two in-person worship opportunities on Sundays, one right here in the sanctuary and one modern service in Finn Hall, both at 1115. And so if you are ready to come for in-person worship, then we would invite you to go on our website and find more information. Let us know that you're coming. We'll be so happy to see you here. Today is the first Sunday in Lent, and we are beginning our Lenten journey with a sermon series called Real Like Jesus. We're going to look to Jesus's example so that we can draw closer to him, so that we can be more like him. There are some special opportunities that are coming up during this season, and would invite you to go online to our website to find out all of those opportunities uh, and how you can engage in those, I know that you will be blessed. Uh, we know that wherever we are, that God truly is with us and God connects us in our worship. And so I would just invite you to, to take a moment just to center yourself, to welcome God into your hearts. Let God know all that you are thankful for and let God know all that you need. God is faithful to listen and to provide. And so I know that you will be blessed today during this time of worship. And so let us begin by offering our worship as we sing together our opening hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
together in our affirmation of faith. McFarlane, though the pandemic disrupts and hurts, let us affirm our confidence in God together. God is with us, and we are filled with hope by the power of the Spirit. We are in this together. We engage faithfully in worship, discipleship, and mission. We pray, share, and care for each and all who suffer. We seek God's wisdom, listen to medical leaders, act, and sacrifice to keep people safe. We pray, plan, and work both now and for the future. We yearn together for the day we will all gather again. We follow Jesus faithfully. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. We are living in the light of 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 God. We are living. Yes, we are living. Oh, we are living in the light of God. We are living. Yes, we are living. Farland, let us join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the God of spring and fall, summer and winter. You are the God of every day, every season, every experience. We look to your life to understand our own lives and to follow your example. God, we want to be real, authentic, whole and free, and we know that we can only walk towards that goal by your power and your grace. God, you who bore the pain of Calvary, you who blessed the ones who cursed you, you who lay in the tomb, who in your rising fulfilled the expectations and prophecies of the ancestors, you who in your ascending gave the promise of new life for us all, in this cold of winter, God, begin the cycle of new life again in our hearts as we tell your story, as we bring to the forefronts of our own desires and needs throughout Lent. God, keep vigil with us as we consider the rough and the smooth edges of our lives. Give us clarity and strength when the winds of challenge blow around us. Help us to remember to call upon your many blessings for our endurance and creativity. Keep us in honesty and truth with the remembrance of your faithfulness, even unto crucifixion. O Christ of all of our days, guardian of us all, we call upon you and we thank you for showing us what it means to be truly human. And we ask these things with open hearts, ready to receive your word. And we pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
church, over the last week, we have been reminded through Ash Wednesday and this winter weather that we've had, the fragility of life. We've been reminded how much we lean, how much we need one another. And so as we enter into this time where we give of our offerings and we bless our offerings, know that this gift that you give multiplies through the church. It goes out and helps those in need. It brings comfort to those who are weary, and it feeds those who are hungry. You can give by going to our website or through our mobile app or by continuing to mail in your offerings in the church. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God, bless these gifts, these gifts that come for you, from you, we give back to you, knowing that wherever there are those who are hungry, those who are thirsty, those who are cold, those who are without, that you are with them, and you call us to be your hands and feet in service and love. Amen. Love, love. 
like Jesus, you can change all this world. Just act like Jesus. scripture reading for today comes from Luke 9 and Ephesians 4. I invite you to hear these words. While everyone was amazed at all that Jesus was doing, he said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands. But they did not understand this saying. Its meaning was concealed from them so that they could not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, aware of their inner thoughts, took a little child and put it by his side and said to them, Whoever welcomes this child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, for the least among all of you is the greatest. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him, for whoever is not against you is for you. And from Ephesians 4, But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Let no talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, we are blessed and eager as we come to listen for your Spirit. We do pray that your word, your voice would sink deep into our ears, as the Scripture says, deep into our minds and hearts so that we might clearly understand what your word is saying to us today. We come, we come praying for the nurture of our own lives, but also that we might together advance the mission of Jesus here and in this world. In his name we pray, amen. Will the real Tony Costello please stand up? That's the line from the pilot for the long-running show we know as To Tell the Truth. That show has been on the air for 31 seasons, revived several times, and is running in 2021. And you know how it goes, probably. There are three people who all claim to be the same person, and then there are contestants who are trying to figure out who is the, the right person, who is the real person. And so they ask questions until they finally decide, and then they submit their decisions, and then the host says, Will the real Tony Costello please stand up? Today we begin this Real Like Jesus sermon series rooted in the Gospel of Luke. 
We are exploring how Jesus models behavior that fosters and strengthens authentic community and the best kind of interpersonal relationships in family and work and community and civic life and in the church. The goal is that we learn from and practice what Jesus modeled and our scriptures teach, that we act like Jesus. The call to us today is to be honest. Let's be honest like Jesus was honest. Chapter 9 in the Gospel of Luke marks the point when Jesus begins his travel to Jerusalem and his crucifixion, a good text for this first Sunday of Lent. Jesus tells the disciples a hard and straightforward truth that he is going to be betrayed and arrested, and he does not yet tell them, though, that some of them are the very ones who will betray him. Well, they don't understand, and they're afraid to ask and and admit their dullness about it all. And so, while they are confused about the truth of that statement, on the other hand, they have no lack of clarity about their biased ambitions as they argue among themselves which is the greatest disciple of them. And so, after Jesus quells that little squall, then John proudly boasts that they tried to stop someone who was casting out demons in Jesus' name because they thought the guy was some sort of imposter, not in their band of brothers. Jesus complicates the truth for them, saying, don't stop him. He's not against us. Since he's not against us, he's actually on our side. As the story goes along, James and John get all protective and angry when Jesus is turned away from a village of Samaritans due to ethnic and religious prejudice rooted in historical experience. They want to command fire to come down from heaven and consume those ingrates. Jesus rebukes his own disciples and reveals the truth about what happened, that it's more complicated than a fight between us and them. His mission is more important than any kind of us versus them religious combat. Jesus models honesty that recognizes the complexity of what is going on. He rebukes their reactive emotions and desires. They're getting all hot and bothered and feeling protective of Jesus over this betrayal thing, this prediction that he'll be betrayed, thinking maybe that it must be those Samaritans who are at fault here. The disciples generate more heat than light. Their emotions override their thinking. They lose perspective and jump to conclusions. They fail to see the whole story and the complexity and the nuances that Jesus understands. They think in terms of binaries, dichotomies, either or, us versus them. Let's be honest like Jesus. Those disciples, forerunners to me and you, fail to understand that there can be both simple or clear truth and complex truth. They had more to learn. Jesus says, let these words sink into your ears. I believe that we can learn more about being honest, about telling all the truth, but telling it with care so as not to harm. I believe Scripture teaches that very thing. In a well-known poem, Emily Dickinson says, Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. Tell all the truth, but tell it in a roundabout way or break it easy or gradually so that it is heard well and does not hurt the relationship. Let the light come on gradually or or risk causing darkness rather than light. 
I don't know if Dickinson was familiar with the Ephesians uh, chapter 4 scripture, but her poem has some real affinity with that. So, in the Gospel of Luke today, Jesus models telling truth and being honest about the complexity related to truth. And in Ephesians 4, we find direct teaching about being honest with our truth telling. Although we read just a few key verses, I recommend the whole of chapter 4 to talk about truth telling and honesty. The emphasis of the chapter is on the unity of the church, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, on building up of relationships and community and how our thinking and our feeling relates to both seeking the truth and practicing honesty. So from Ephesians 4, we hear these specific instructions to the church about how we practice honesty. One, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love so that we mature in our imitation of Christ so that we grow into mature love as the body of Christ and in every relationship that we have. Intentionally avoid any kind of false assumptions or declarations of half-truths. In fact, this biblical text makes it clear that our thinking can be clouded by what we don't know and that such lack of knowledge can be solidified or petrified into a refusal to want to know more when we, well, when we just hold on to the assumptions out of some kind of hardness of heart or refusal to listen. Three, let us all be honest with our neighbors, the Scripture says, with our fellow church members, with family members, with co-workers. Let us all be honest with our neighbors, for we belong with and to one another. This means not only telling the truth we know, but honestly hearing why and how others tell the truth about the same thing from a different angle. And the fourth truth here is that when we tell the truth, Say nothing that is destructive of relationships or community life together, but only what is useful for building up as there is need so that our words may be a gift to those who hear. Our scriptures make it clear that we need to be honest about telling the truth as we know it and that honesty and truth-telling are both in the service of loving relationships and community. Both are necessary and both are subject to love, patience, care, grace, and reservation of judgment. This is true in church. It's true in marriage, parenting. It should be true in the competitive worlds of commerce and school, whether in an office complex or a manual labor enterprise And hopefully it can be true even in the complicated world of politics and civic life. We all know that there can be a variety of perspectives and interpretations related to a single set of facts. But our emotions and our experience of the facts can make it difficult to admit that we may not have all the facts. In late May of 2019, Elizabeth and I were driving west on Northwest 23rd Street in Oklahoma City. It was a warm day and a sunny afternoon. We had had lunch together, and we were driving home. We stopped behind a pickup truck at a a stoplight. The light turned green, and the truck started to go, and I followed, accelerating at a normal pace, and suddenly the truck stopped, and I went for the brake, and it was too late. We hit the bumper, under the bumper. Eventually, we knew our car was totaled. So we got out. We weren't hurt, and thankfully no one else was hurt. We stood on the sidewalk. There we heard from the driver in front of us that someone in a red sports car had swerved in front of him very quickly and stopped. And then after the truck had stopped, The guy in the sports car shrugged his shoulders, obviously, and sped off. 
while we were standing there on the sidewalk, a woman, a young woman came up. Uh, she had seen it all, and she stopped to tell us about it. She had been driving behind the sports car, and she had seen him uh, trying to, to get past the truck and not being able to and making rude gestures and uh, tailgating and driving recklessly. And so there we were, standing there, talking about what had happened. We had at least four experiences of the facts of the case. There was our experience of what happened, the truck driver and the passenger with him, the kind-hearted witness, and the guy who got away. But we didn't know his story. We all had our emotions and passions. The truck driver was not hurt, and it was his company's truck, and, and the truck was not even hurt. And so he was fine, no sweat off his back. The young woman seemed to want to make the world right. She had a passion for justice. She wanted us to know, and she wanted the police to know exactly what happened. We were frustrated, of course, and a bit jarred, but okay, glad to be okay. Then came the police officer, and his job, of course, is to gather the stories and perspectives and facts and put it all together and make something out of it. And not yet in the picture, of course, is the perspective of the insurance companies. And, of course, I was contending with the police officer that this was unavoidable, it happened too fast, and that this reckless driver who's now gone was the cause and the blame. We each had our own interests and facts as we knew them around the story. We also each had our inclinations to judge the disappearing driver, to speculate about why the runaway was in such a hurry, why he was seemingly so angry and vengeful. But we cannot know what we don't know. It would be easy to assume that he was just an impatient jerk. But I remember getting the news that my dad had had a sudden heart attack and that he was dying, and how I drove fast and hard, taking some risks, weaving through traffic in Kingfisher, going off of the road into the construction zone, being yelled at by a guy in a big asphalt truck. I was driven by love on the verge of grief, just trying to get to that hospital and beside my dad a hundred miles away. Maybe the man in the red car was also somehow feeling desperate and supremely frustrated. Not to excuse his behavior, but to say, I don't know his story. There could have been a dozen reasons, perhaps, for his actions that day. I know the truth about my thoughts and feelings and actions, but I don't know what I don't know. Unless I would sit down and talk with that young man, with that mystery driver, I just cannot know. We just don't know what we don't know until we let information or insights sink into our ears, our hearts, and our minds. Organizational psychologist Adam Grant, author of the best-selling book, Think Again, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know, describes an experiment conducted in the Difficult Conversations Lab in Columbia University. Each participant is matched up with a stranger who strongly disagrees on some politi politically hot and controversial topic. They are given just 20 minutes to discuss the issue, and then both have to decide whether they're aligned enough to write a joint statement, sign it about their shared views. If they're able to do that, which is no small feat, of course, their statement will be posted on a public forum. Before beginning, some of the participant pairs first read an article about a different but similarly divisive issue that tells just two sides of the story. Of those, 46% are able to find enough common ground to draft and sign a statement together 
which is in itself a remarkable result. But something far more impressive, Grant says, has happened. Other pairs are randomly assigned to read another version of the Other Issue article, which has led 100% to be able to craft and sign a joint statement. The version of the article that they read before they did the work, the conversation, was a version that gave the same information about the other issue, but presents it differently. Instead of describing the matter as a disagreement between just two sides, the article frames the debate as a complex issue representing a number of differing points of view. Since the authoritative guidance in Ephesians 4 promotes thinking, speaking, and acting in ways that foster and maintain loving, harmonious, long-term relationships and group life, let's be honest. Such relationship and community building requires us to recognize the complexity of controversial matters and to rethink the us versus them polarizing, sometimes demonizing mentality with which people often approach difficult issues. Let's be honest. We can affirm truths that are clear and straightforward once we have realized the truth of that matter in all its fullness, but knowing the truth about others' experience, their motives, their desires, intentions, is often complex and tentative. We need to be honest about that, especially when it comes to fostering and maintaining mature, authentic community, cohesive community with groups of persons from immediate family all the way to the global community and all those entities in between. Let's be honest that, like the disciples, our feelings, fear, anger, desire, self-defense, our, our intuitions, our suspicions, are often in the driver's seat rather than our reason or the mandate of God's higher mission. As much as I and we depend on and celebrate reason and logic and database decision-making, If we are honest, we know that many times we use our ability to reason to rationalize, to rationalize what we feel is true rather than to do the research, the investigation, the listening. We use it to defend what we think rather than discern fresh truth in another person of good faith who may see it a little bit differently than we do. Let's be honest enough to know that when we have conversation about matters that are serious, significant, and sensitive, when the hill is long or the mud is thick or the way prone to collision like a car on a snow-packed road, then we need to intentionally shift into the best gear and measure our pace Then it's time to engage in humble honesty with curiosity, listening, and awareness of our own emotions, suspending at least temporarily any hardened opinion long enough to truly understand how someone else might also share some of God's truth with us on this topic. Then it's time to shift into wanting to know the truth more than wanting to be right. There are several such serious, significant, sensitive conversations made so in part by the severe polarization that politicizes what are first of all human experience and realities. Such polarizing tears at friendships, families, churches, neighbors. We sense the tension, we we feel the pain, And, of course, we hope for resolution. A case in point is the reality of racial injustice. 
It's one such conversation. I believe we all agree that racial injustice and discrimination is wrong. But there may be disagreement about the depth and extent to which racism is still operative in our culture. Now, I bring this up as a case in point because Scripture is clear that no one should suffer discrimination or exclusion due to race or ethnicity. It's also clear that the church, like God, is to be impartial and actively open to the wonderful diversity of God's creation. I also name this today because I want to provide or at least point to biblical warrant and context, biblical warrant and context for the work of our Just Action team. This team is made up of good faith members of our church who love this church and love the people of this church, our sisters and brothers who feel called to help us learn together and act together so that we can name and seek to remove any latent and harmful racial bias that remains embedded in our culture and our systems. This is not judgment. This is honest truth-seeking, honest desire to increase the love and righteousness that Jesus teaches. It's impossible, uh, rather it's possible that some among us do not feel like racial injustice somehow abides around us. Maybe other places, but surely not here. Friends, I'm inviting all of us to suspend judgment, to engage in good faith conversation to honor the work of our sisters and brothers on the Just Action team with open hearts and minds, to engage in studies or book readings or learning when we can, to listen to guest speakers that may come and offer suggestions also and recommendations to the Just Action team out of the variety of our experience. Well, I've been saying... Let's be honest. Now, let me be honest. Let me use a part of my story to share what is on my heart. In an effort to be honest, a few years ago, I took an assessment of my thinking and behavior and attitudes to see what my default setting is with regard to differences related to culture, race, and ethnicity. And like many other United Methodist pastors and members, minimization, to minimize, described where I fit on a spectrum beyond denial and beyond polarization, but not fully accepting and adapting to the real and deep cultural differences that exist and the bias and discrimination that is still experienced in our society. So I engage with a United Methodist pastor in Kansas who is female and African American as my coach to help me learn and grow. I also honestly open myself to hear from other African American leaders, colleagues, sisters and brothers in the faith. Now I don't claim to have arrived, but I know the Holy Spirit is working in my life. And I am glad to be on the journey. I want you to know I'm also recording a video statement for our church that should come out this week. In it, I will share my heart and my confidence that we can have honest and open conversation about racial injustice as part of our calling and faith that's rooted deep in the powerful and healing love of God in Jesus Christ. I hope you will look for that video and listen with an open heart. How wonderful, how beautiful, Psalm 133 says, when, when brothers and sisters get along. And it is wonderful and beautiful. We do get along and we will get along. How grand it is with God's help when we can be renewed and enlightened in the spirit of our minds and hearts 
when we can speak the truth in love. How marvelous it is that we can measure and pace our words and conversation to speak what is constructive and gracious, even on difficult topics, even if it's in between me and my spouse, or me and my child, or me and my co-workers, or other groups of people. How blessed we are that even more, and just when needed, we can become helpfully kind to one another, inwardly compassionate, forgiving just as God has graciously forgiven us and continues to forgive us. How blessed we are. Let us pray. Thank you, O God, for speaking to us, for giving us your word, in which we find this invitation to let truth and the truth about truth-telling and honesty sink deep into our lives. May it be so, for we long to be real like Jesus. Amen. Friends, as you go to live your life this week, may the God of all hope fill you with such joy and peace in believing and trusting that hope may indeed abound in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.